unplug. We're talking about what it means to unplug from the things that swirl around, drive us crazy, they aren't healthy. And sometimes our lives look like this surge protector, which is like everything plugged in and then expanders on expanders. And, and there's a point where you just say, you know, is there too much going on? Am I plugged in in too many ways? And last week we talked about sort of unplugging some things from our heart. You know, the the, the things that create anxiety and worry. How do we unplug from anxiety and worry? And how do we plug into a confident peace in the presence of the living God? And and, and this week uh, we're we're talking about another kind of unplugging our body from the busyness of life. Unplugging kind of our whole life from the the rat race of life. And unplugging from business and plugging into God's rest the Sabbath that he offers. Next week, we'll talk about unplugging kind of our eyes and our brains from all the stuff that's coming in and filling us and plugging into kind of God's creation and the goodness of what he's made. But as I was preparing this series, what struck me was that each different week might touch different people in different ways. Last week, I I had a bunch of people last week after the services and also during the week say, I so needed a message about anxiety and worry. And I just feel like my heart's kind of walking with greater peace. This week, un- unplugging from busyness and the hurriedness of life. As I was preparing, this was the week that God said, this is for you, Kevin. This is, I, I live my life very full, very busy. I like doing a lot of things. But God's been reminding me of his power to bring peace you know, in, in all of my life. So we're talking today about un- the, the, the pathway to peace is unplugging from constant busyness and plugging into God's rest. And the reality is our world is a busy world. Our world has a rhythm to it that's kind of like push, 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 go, go, go. And in some ways, these last couple of years have forced some people to slow down. But some of those people right now, they're like this at the edge of the door of their house. They're like this at the, at the starting line. And the minute somebody says, okay, that's, that, that limitation has dropped, whoa, here I go. I'm going to sign my kids back up for 18 sports. And I'm going I'm to get my kids in 27 activities. And I'm going to do this, 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 this. And, and I want to suggest that maybe God might want to use this moment where people were forced to slow down. Where family, maybe some families said, you know, we actually hung out together in the evenings. We played some board games. We didn't know we had those. And we, we just enjoyed slowing down a little bit. Maybe God will use a really hard couple of years to give us fresh perspective if we don't let ourselves just get kind of catapulted and sucked back into that crazy racing through every aspect of life. I don't believe that God creates evil or bad. God is good and God is loving. But God can use tough things and bad things for his glory. And so I want to invite you today just to think about your own life and the pace you run and what you do. And you have to understand, busyness isn't just for people who are working. It isn't just for, you know, I, I've, I've seen families where the kids are exhausted because they're going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. I talk to people who are retired. And you know what they'll tell me? I'm busier than I've ever been. I've heard that a lot of times. You know, they're, they're retired. This is the time to have some rest and refresh. I'm just, because they're just saying yes to so many things. And God wants to offer, in the midst of our busy world, a rhythm of life that's punctuated by heavenly rest that makes all the rest of life make sense. So Lord, this is our prayer today. As we look at your word and God, as we humbly look at our lives, will you speak to us about the the crazy driven busyness that guides so many of our lives? And would you also speak to us about the peace and the rest and the Sabbath goodness that you want to offer us and help us slow down and find your pace for our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bible on an app or a phone or something, you can go to Genesis chapter 2. At the very, very beginning, when we, Genesis chapter 1 is a, is a busy chapter of the Bible. God is creating. He speaks. And the heavens and the earth come into existence. God speaks. And there's stars and universes. And, and God speaks. And there's plants and land. And God speaks. And there's animals. And then finally God speaks. And there's people. And so for six days, God has spoken. God has worked. God has created. And then we pick this up in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. 
By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So for six days, God speaks, God creates. And just beauty and power unleashed. And on the seventh day, God says, okay, I'm going to Sabbath. I'm going to rest. I'm going to take a load off. God rests on the seventh day. Here's the question. Why? Why did God rest on the seventh day? Let me ask you a question. Did God rest on the seventh day because he was just exhausted, tired, and worn out? Is that why God rested? No. no. Why not? Because God's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. So God didn't, God didn't rest like we rest because he was tired. But God rested. Why? And here's what I believe. I believe God rested for you and for me. I believe God rested to set us an example of a rhythm of life that he had created and built into our souls and our bodies and into the flow of the universe. God took time to rest. I want you to see a little picture here on the screen. It's just a picture of a dad helping out his kid, you know, explaining how an engine works and kind of teaching him about, about different things. And, you know, when a, when a parent, when a dad or a mom explains to a, to a son or a daughter how to do something, They'll talk kind of slowly. First time they explain, they'll, they'll give a lot of details. I mean, they know what they're doing, but they're slowing down and they're kind of explaining. I remember when my dad explained to me when I first started driving. Before I, and my dad, my dad was a, a teacher at heart. He talked to me about, you know, if you, you, know, how, you know, how to drive, even though I'd learned from the driver's ed stuff. And he talked to me, if a police ever pulls you over, this is how you, you put your hands at 10 and 2, you don't move. You say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And you do, you know, he, he walked me through all that. But he, when he explained to me about first, when I started driving, he said, now, if your car's overheating, he says, pull over to the side of the road, and he says, don't turn it off. And you're going to go, and you're going to check your radiator. And he shows me where the radiator, and he's explaining it. He says, and here's the thing. It's going to be hot, and you want to wait a little bit, let the engine kind of settle down, and then you can put a cloth over it. And you know, he's explaining like to a child. I was 16, but he was, I'm his boy. I'm his kid. He wanted me to know how to do it. And he said, now, when you do it, there's going to probably be some heat and some steam and maybe some hot water that comes up. He said, but if you turn the engine off, it, all the pressure comes up, and it'll blow up right in your face. Some of you know that because you go, I did that one time. And you experience that, right? The louder you're laughing, the more you got burned, right? But, but, but it's like, you know, and why did my dad explain? He, he knew he was doing it for me. So when you read in Genesis chapter 2, when God says after six days of labor, okay, I'm going to rest. You know what he was doing? He was setting you an example, setting me an example of how to live life. He said, look at your daddy, look at your heavenly father. You need a rhythm of rest. You're made for work. In creation, before the fall, God's people were working. You're made to work. You're made to produce. You're made to find meaning in your labor. But you're also made for rest. And so it's so important to God, it was so important that at the beginning of creation, God rested to say, kids, see your dad? See how I'm doing this? This is how you live your life. Work hard. Do what you do. Work at your studies at school. Be involved in your sports. Work at your job. Pour into relationships. Volunteer in the church. Volunteer in the community. Work hard. And then have a rhythm where you go, okay, and now, whew, dial down. Settle down. There, there's a way that God has made us. So we unplug from the, for, we unplug from the world's rhythm and pace. So, so we're, un, we're okay, my, my, my pace, just the raw pace of how my body moves, how my life moves, how full my schedule is, if it's overdone. And you say, I'm always busy, but I'm always exhausted. I never feel rested. You say, okay, then what, what can I unplug? You know, what is it? You know, so I don't need this anymore, and I don't think I ever needed that. And I didn't, I didn't even plug that in. Who put that in my life? You know, you're going, okay, there's, there's things that start going, okay, I can unplug from some things. And, and part of that is unplugging from the rhythms and the pace of our world. Our world moves fast. And even for retired people, it's like people start going, well, now that you're retired, can you do this? Can you help with this? I think you ought to. I think the Lord wants you to. I think you should. And all of a sudden they're going, man, i got to go back to work so I can relax. <laughs> right? It's like, what, that, that's, our world can be like that. Jesus recognized this. Back in the first century when Jesus walked on this planet, he looked at people and he saw that they were exhausted. And he explained to them kind of a rhythm of life and a way of life 
that he wants us to have a life that has rest and meaning and richness. So when we unplug from the world's pace, what we do is we plug, we, we plug into Jesus. And so here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and who are burdened, all you who are exhausted and tired out. And Jesus says what? I will give you rest. This is the heart of Jesus. Then he says some things that if you are a first century farmer will make sense. If you're not a first century farmer, they might. Any first century farmers here? It's not the first. But here's what Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls deep in who you are. Then Jesus says this. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Again, if you're not a first century farmer, that may not make much sense, but let me explain it to you. In the first century, there weren't tractors, and most you know, large farming plots of land were taken care of with an ox or oxen that pulled a plow. And over the shoulder of the ox was a yoke. It was a wooden instrument that rested on their shoulders, and then they could attach things to it to pull a plow or to carry a load. But here's the thing about a yoke. If it didn't fit right, it would chafe, it would blister, and that animal couldn't carry the load they were supposed to carry. It's like if you say you're going to go out for a hike, and you have, I'm going to try out these brand new boots I've never worn before and do a 10-mile hike. Always a bad idea, right? And I'll wear one thin pair of socks, you know? Some of you have been there, right? And once you have one blister, two, 27 blisters on your feet, you're kind of walking along, or you're trying to act real cool. I'm fine, no, really. But it's, you can't move the way you're meant to move. Well, the same was true for an ox. So, and Jesus grew up in a carpenter shop. His father, Joseph, was a carpenter. So he would, they, but here's the thing. You just, didn't just go and buy, okay, I'll have a yoke. Let me buy a yoke. You'd have to bring the ox in. And, and a carpenter would shape the yoke to fit on that ox. Why? Because a yoke that fits right, not only doesn't hurt, the animal can carry a bigger load. They can plow better. They get more done when it fits right. Jesus isn't saying, if you come to me, you'll never work. You'll never do anything with your life. He's saying, if you come to me and what I've made for you fits on you right, you can actually feel restful and refreshed even while you're working because you have the right equipment. You have, you're, you're living the right way. Here at Shoreline Church, every year, we ask all of our staff members three questions. We have a little survey that they fill out to get a sense of where they're at. And we ask them, what percentage of your work and your time and the, the work you're doing here at Shoreline, what percentage of it fits your gifting, kind of the way God's made you, your calling, what you believe you're made for, and also your passion, what you love to do. And here's what we've learned. And every year, if somebody says, you know, 25% of my time is in my gifting, 10% is in my passion, man, they're, they're going to be an unhappy, miserable worker, right? We try to keep people above 70% in every area. You can't always do everything you want to do, but if you can get in the area that you're gifted and called, man, it fits. And so I think, I think of Pastor Dennis. And Pastor Dennis, uh, he oversees counseling and care. This guy was made for counseling and care. This is, this is what he loves to do. And so if I see Dennis, I say, hey, Dennis, how's it going? How are you enjoying working? Show you kind of how things going? Pig, well, I, I mean, I, I, Dennis will say, I'm like a pig in slop. I'm like a pig in slop. Metaphor aside, um, he's, he's saying, I love what I'm doing. And if I ask Heather, his wife, who's sitting next to him, I say, Heather, how you doing? She'll usually say, I'm what? Living I'm living the dream. Being part of ministry here isn't easy. It's, there's a lot involved in it, right? There's a lot going on. But, if, but if, if, you're, if you're in the rhythm of life that God has made for you, and you do, you're doing what, you're, what fits your passions, what fits your calling, and what fits your gifting, then the yoke is easy and the burden is light because it fits who you are. If you work in the business world and you can incorporate that, just that dis discussion with your staff members or your team members, what's your passion, what's your calling? They may not understand calling from a biblical standpoint, but just a the person they feel called to do with their lives. And you know, what, what's, their, what's their gifting, passion, and call? And you can get people close to the center of that. They find joy in what they do. And I can tell you, for, for myself personally as a pastor, um, I spend a lot of my time doing what God's made me for and what I love to do. So I can work long days and do a lot of stuff. And I'm like, it's, it's fun. I love it. That's what G Jesus wants your yoke to be easy and your burden light. He wants you to do what he's called you to do, what he's made you to do, what you love to do. And when you do that, you become unbelievably productive and fruitful in your life. And so, so again, if you're in the business world and you want to use that to talk with your staff members, it would be helpful. So here's a question. 
What life rhythms and patterns are wearing you down and stealing your peace? You know, what, what life patterns are wearing you down and stealing your peace? That, that, that go, 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 push, push, push. You gotta, gotta, gotta. You need to, need to, need to. And you just feel exhausted. So we need to unplug from that worldly thinking of just, of just always going, going, going. And there's a different way to think. And here's where we plug in. We plug into God's sweet Sabbath rhythm as a lifestyle. We plug into a lifestyle that says every seven days in a rhythm of life, from busy work and school and studies and work around the house, caring for children, all, all, you see, for all these things I'm doing that fill my life up. And I have a rhythm where I actually step into a place of Sabbath rest that brings refreshment to me and that honors God. In Exodus chapter 20, when God is giving his top 10, his 10 commandments, 10 things that, that will help us live life to the fullest, we read these words in verse 8 of Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. It's okay. Work is good. Work is a gift. Work hard. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your kids, your son or your daughter, nor your workers, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he, God, rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. There's a rhythm of life that God wants for you and wants for me. He's built into our souls, into our minds, into our emotional being. And if we push seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, on and on, and take no break, and no rhythm of rest, we are not becoming the kind of people he wants us to be. We'll become less productive, less happy, less fun to be around. <laughs> Everything changes. God is so wise that he's built in this rhythm of life for us in the Sabbath. In the ancient world, God's people would celebrate Sabbath from Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. And there's lots of different kind of theories of exactly how that worked. Most, most of God's people at that time, they would do it, they would start their Sabbath just before sundown to make sure that they didn't encroach on that. And then when sun went, sun went down on Saturday, they would wait until there was three stars in the sky. And somebody talked to me who grew up Jewish and said, I had said one star and I had heard that, but they said they said three stars because they would make sure it was one star and then you had to make sure there was two and three to be extra careful. And so, and there's all these different, you know, they had to be small stars, medium stars, but it's, when you get into that kind of legalism, it's going too far, but here's the concept. And this is the heartbeat of what Jesus wanted. For a chunk of time every week, you unplug you disconnect from the crazy pace of the world and you get the rhythm of rest that God has for you. For me, the day that I Sabbath, the day that I kind of go, okay, I'm gonna dial back. I'll tell you a little secret. It's not on Sunday for me. <laughs> as much as I love all of you, as much as I love preaching, um, su Sundays can range from you know, nine hours to 12 hour days. I love what I do, but it's not a day of rest. For me, it's usually Thursday or Friday. And on that day, I spend more time with Jesus in the mornings I usually get with some friends and play a little bit of golf. I'll hang out with my wife, Sherry. I'll, I'll just kind of linger and, and just, and just kind of do some things I enjoy. And by the end of that day, I'm ready to get back to life. I actually, I actually feel refreshed. But that, that's a rhythm. I don't know what it is for you. And, and I don't believe that Jesus is about being legalistic. We'll see that in another passage. He's not about being legalistic. The Sabbath is a gift for us. But boy, we have to receive that gift. And I know people that don't. Thank you, Lord, but no thank you. Trust me, God, you might have needed some rest, but not me. Whoa. Do you know when you refuse the Sabbath what you're saying? God, maybe the maker of heaven and earth and the creator of all the universe needed a break, but I'm good, thanks anyways. No. There, there, there's a rhythm. So we unplug from the world's rhythm and we plug into the rhythm of Sabbath that God gives to us as a gift. And then there's also an attitude that we have to unplug from. We need to unplug from an I can do it all mindset. And we think that way sometimes. I can do everything. I can do it all. And, and, and when we have that, and, and I think that's part of what the world will say. Oh, you can work full-time and be a full, you know, great full-time parent and also have great friendships and a great walk with Jesus and have 14 hobbies you're involved in and this and this and this, and then you'll be happy. And when you talk to people that are trying to do it all, let me ask you a question. When you talk to people that are trying to do it all, are they almost ever happy? No. They're just rushing from place to place, but there's this mindset I, I need to do it all. I can do it all. It's okay to try to do everything that's out there. And, and, and that's simply not 
realistic. It's not the way God's designed us. So a question for you. Ask yourself, how have I been sucked into doing more than I should or than God wants for me? Are there areas of your life where you just go right, you just stop right now, you go, boy, you know what? I've been pulled into so many things. I've overdone it. And you have the courage to step back from some of those things. I said earlier, but I want to say it again. I'm, I'm, I really believe in this moment in time, if, we, if we're wise and careful, we can say to the, to the next generation, you don't have to do a thousand things every week. And maybe you've dialed back and slowed down a little bit. And maybe some of you are like, nah, now we're going to take, take our kids and we're just going to like, boom, shoot them back full speed into everything. So is, that, is that the best rhythm of life? Because the world says, do it all, try to do it all, try to fit it all in. But, but God has a different perspective on that. We, we unplug from a mindset that says, I can do it all. And here's what we plug our minds into. We plug into, I will do all God has for me, thinking. I can do it all if all I do is what God wants for me. But I can't do it all, I can't do all the world offers. There's even very compassionate people, very loving Christians. They're like, oh, there's a need. I can meet that need. That's a need. I can do that. That's a need. And they just get exhausted. Well, doesn't Jesus want me to meet every need? No! You're not Jesus. He wants you to meet every need he calls you to meet. Well, then what, how do I figure that out? You talk to Jesus. You say, Lord, is this what you have for me? I have two men in my life that mentor me regularly. And in both cases, when I contacted them and asked them if they would consider spending time with me on a monthly basis and pouring into my life, they both gave me the same response. Here's what they said. Let me take some time and pray about it. Those might be the best words you ever learned to say. Let me take some time and pray about it. They both did. Within a week, they both reached out back to me and said, I'd be honored to, I'd love to. But you know what I know they did? They actually prayed. They said, Lord, are you calling me in this season of my life, they're both in retirement, to pour into another person? Because I know I'm not the only, I'm not the only pastor that they're encouraging and spending time with. But they, so, so when someone comes to you and says, will you, could you, would you, I think, should you? You know, <laughs> I believe you should do it. You know, they're like, be, just say, hey, let me, let me take a little time and pray about that. If a non-believing friend asks you, would you? Say to him, you know, give me, give me a couple days to pray about that. That might open a conversation about Jesus. When I mean, you think you could pray and God will lead you? Oh, man, he does. That might just open up the door to talk about your relationship with Jesus. But to say, give me some time to pray about that. And then, as you're praying, if you feel this deep conviction from the Holy Spirit, yes, this is for you, then do it with all your heart. But if you don't feel a call or a leading, then graciously say, hey, thanks for the offer. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for thinking of me. But that's not going to work out. And all of a sudden, your life begins to be shaped not by, I can do everything. i got to do everything. And I'm going to go from there. To, to going, oh, I, I know the things I'm doing are what God has for me. Because <sighs> God knows your burdens and knows when you get weary. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It fits. And can I tell you right now, those of you that have kids or grandkids in, you know, from like you know, seven, eight years old up into their early teens, middle teens, set them a model of a life with a rhythm of working hard and resting well. God's not anti-work. Matter of fact, God said God worked for six days and rested for one. He didn't even get a two-day weekend? Well, I don't know how that works, but it's just like, you know, God, but, 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 but there's that rhythm where we work hard and we rest well and we become who God wants us to be. I will do all God has for me. That's the way we should think. So in Mark chapter 2, beginning of verse 23, it's a Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. And Jesus is walking with his disciples. And one of them, a couple of them do something that was actually work. You know, picking grain. They would actually pick grain and then do this with their hands and then they eat the kernels. And that actually was breaking three different laws of Sabbath. And, and the way that they, there was the call to Sabbath and there was all the laws they made that had nothing to do with Sabbath, but they had to do with kind of legalism, right? And so here's what we read in Mark 2, 20, 2 28, 3. One Sabbath day, Jesus was going through the grain fields. As he and his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. This is for a little snack as they were walking, and which was allowed. It was allowed in the corners of the fields in those days. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They're not resting because they picked some grain, right? Jesus answered, have you, ever, have you never read what David, King David, did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abithar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is unlawful, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. So Jesus says, David broke 
the official law to fulfill the spirit of the law. All right? Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for people, for men, for women, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God gave us this rhythm of rest and gave us a Sabbath day not to handcuff us, not to steal our fun, but so that we would have a rhythm of life where in one out of seven days, we just get to you know, spend some, a little extra time with Jesus and hang out with friends and quiet our souls and not do the stuff we do all the other days of the week. God gave it as a gift to us, not to take away our joy, but to offer us joy, the joy of his presence, the, joy, the, you know, the strength of his rest. And can I tell you something about the rhythm of Sabbath? I absolutely believe that people who work seven days a week will have less joy in their work, will get less done, and will make less money than somebody who works six days a week and rests one day. You say, well, that math doesn't add up. Well, biblical math is not like human math. If you read it in the book of Exodus about the God providing manna for the people, he provided manna six days, but there was always enough for seven days. And if they went out and tried to collect man on the seventh day, it would go rotten. God was saying, trust me, trust me. In six days, I'll provide all you need. And if you get this rhythm of rest and, and you get the right thinking about it and you say, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rest as you call me to and, I, and I'm going to do the things you call me to do, you will find that your life is healthier, your joy is higher, and, and, you, and you just recognize that God is present in providing for you. So here's a question. Do you ask God, is this for me? How often do you just pause when there's an opportunity, business opportunity, a friendship opportunity, a recreational opportunity? Do you have a habit of just saying, Lord, is this for me? I only have so much time. I have one life to live for you. I have only one day to live today, you know, and this opportunity is coming in front of me. Lord, is this for me? You'll find in life there's times you're going to say no to even good and fun things because it's not what God has for you. And your life will be a lot more balanced, a lot healthier when you're having rest along the way and when you're doing the things that you believe that God has called you to do. So ask God that question. Lord, is this for me? One more unplug and one more plug in when it comes to, to, to really facing this part of our lives. Unplug from wasted time. Sometimes the business in our lives is not good stuff or even valuable stuff. It's just wasted time. There's the, we're, we're, we're like, you know, man, this, there's this whole thing in my life, and if I honestly, if I unplug it from my life, not only will I have more time and more peace, my life is better immediately. I just got involved in doing something, I got in the habit of doing something, and it's not even helpful. It's maybe damaging or hurtful. So maybe it's time to kind of remove that from the scene of my life. So we need to unplug from wasted time. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17, we read these words. Be careful then how you live. That's a great way to start. Be careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. There's unwise ways to live. There's wise ways to live. Listen to this. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is God's will? What does he want me to do? Be wise in your use of your time. Your life matters. And what God can do in you and through you is more than you imagine or dream. Don't squander it. Don't, don't, don't let silly things and silly patterns and silly habits that you've got involved in, they go, well, I've been doing this for a week, a month, a year, 10 years. It's never gonna change. You know, boy, if that's a pattern in my life, that's a habit. It's filling time, but it's producing nothing and maybe doing damage. Maybe this is time to say, I gotta unplug from that thing. I need to unplug from that thing that's just, and a lot, can I tell you, a lot of those things are just neutral. They're not good or bad. It's just, they're just time fillers. But do I need to be doing that? Lord, is that something you have for me and want for me? Unplug from waste of time. So a question for your personal reflection. How am I wasting time in a normal week? How am I wasting time? In a, if you looked at your week and said, man, if I unplug that, that thing I'm doing, I'd have like nine more hours. Wow. What can I do with that? How might God use it? How, maybe I just take a nap, you know? Maybe we can refresh and rest a little bit but we can fill so much into our lives that all of a sudden we're busy and driven even when the things that are making us busy aren't that important. So, so we unplug from the waste of time and then the other side we plug in, we plug in the personal investment of your hours, days, and life. You say, I want to pour into things. I want, to make an, I want my life to matter. 
I want, I, want to, I want to be a blessing. I want to leave a legacy. I want to do things that would glorify God. I want to do things that would bring joy to other people. I want to help my family and leave a legacy for them. I want to do the things that really matter and make a difference. And you can't do that if you're driven all the time, busy, and you have no space to think it through. So here's one last question. What can I do to use my time for things that really matter? You know, what, what can I do to say, God, I have this day. I have this week ahead of me. What can I do that's going to be a blessing, that's going to really matter? Some people overextend by volunteering in the church. Do you know there's people who just go, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, and then they're exhausted. And some of those people need to unplug a little bit from church stuff. But a lot of people never plug in to serving in the church and don't find the joy of, of sitting. I, I saw a woman this morning, uh, it's actually Pastor Roy, who's not a young fella, his mom, his mommy, Marion. And she saw me before the first service. She's, she says, oh, Pastor Kevin, I'm going to go down and see if I can hold some babies and help them in the nursery. And if not, I'll be up in worship. Just, just a desire to care for those little ones. So some of you, you know, and in the family worship venue or in the, out in the court, could come and sit and receive and be part of worship and, and not have that response. You love your kid, but it's like, okay, just for an hour, here you go, right? And you have people who say, I'll do that. People who pour into the children in our children's ministry and the middle school and the high school kids in our next-gen ministry. And they plugged in there. And God's using them to change lives for eternity. Making space to hang around neighbors in your neighborhood that don't know Jesus and shine and share his light and his love. What are the things we can plug into that make a difference? When God created the heavens and the earth, when God spoke and scattered the stars across the sky and, and created land and sea and animals and people and was all done, God Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the maker of heaven and earth said, okay, I'm gonna take a day off. I'm gonna rest. I'm gonna create a rhythm for the universe. He didn't do it because he was exhausted. He did it because he knew you and how he would make you. And that your life would be better and richer and more productive if you get a rhythm of working hard and resting well. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. In this world that drives us to go, 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 in a time when things are opening back up again, and it would be so easy to just jump back into all the crazy busyness that was there before, or to see our kids, the next generation, get so busy doing stuff, they never learn a rhythm of rest. Lord, Lord, may we take this moment, hearing the words of Jesus, whose yoke is easy, whose burden is light, hearing the words of the book of Genesis, that God, you rested. Hearing the words of the book of Exodus, that, that remind us that we are to have a rhythm of rest not only us, but our family members and those that were around us, a rhythm of acknowledging, God, that you can provide all we need in six days of work. And Lord, if we can learn this rhythm, we believe that we will find more joy and more peace and more meaning and actually more production and fruitfulness in our lives than if we worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Teach us, O oh Lord, your rhythm for life. And as we walk in it, make us more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you an invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, here at Shoreline, we do dedication of children, and we have lots of little ones around the church. And I know right now, we still, even as of last Sunday, we had three people online for every one on campus. And so whether you're online uh, at home or whether you're here on campus, if you have a little one that's never been dedicated and kind of offered to the Lord, we take a time in our services where we pray over them, we pray for their families, we pray for us as a church family to love them well and point them towards Jesus. It's a great, meaningful time. Uh, anyone who wants to attend that class, it's today at 1 o'clock online. It won't be in person. It'll be completely online. So all you do is, when you get home, go on the front of the webpage, click on the registration. If you're not sure how that works and you're on campus, walk by the Connection Center. They'll register you right now. But we want to be able to bless you by dedicating children to the Lord. So that's at 1 o'clock today online. If you need prayer today, maybe you look at your life and say, man, I'm overextended. I'm busy. I'm running hard. I need to learn to, to really find a new rhythm of life. Let someone pray for you. 
If you have a need or a joy, let someone pray for you today and come forward. If you're on, on, on campus, come forward here for prayer. If you're online, you can call the number you see right there and somebody will answer that phone and pray for you. Or you can send in uh, your prayer needs to the email address there and we'll have our prayer teams pray for you over the next week or two. And so make sure you do that. And if you're, if you're visiting with us and you're online and you're new, we want to give you a personal welcome. If you'll just text the word welcome to the phone number you see, we'll respond back to you and give you a personal warm welcome as best we can. And if you're on campus, just go by the Connection Center, right in the, in the lobby there, and they have a little gift bag they want to give you. They want to give you a personal welcome and answer your questions. So we're glad you're here. And I believe it's not an accident that anyone's here today on campus or online. God's hand is in that. And so here, listen to God's message. And if this message, I had a couple of people say to me, boy, I want to share this message with friends, the one from last week and the theme of this week. Um, just uh, go online, find the YouTube uh, version of it, and copy the, the link and mail it to somebody. Say, hey, you might want to, it's 33 minutes, you might want to watch this, it might encourage you in this crazy time. And so share, share God's word with people by connecting them to, to some of the sermons from Storyline as well. If you're able to stand... I want to invite you to stand wherever you are, at home, stand if you will. Family worship, family worship venue was getting packed this morning, uh, so we bless all of you in the family worship venue. I got to worship with you in song two today in the worship set and outdoors as well. A little chilly out there. Just quiet your heart and receive this blessing as you go from this place, as we finish this time together. May you recognize the crazy pace of life this world tries to drive you. May you turn to Jesus and hear him say, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. And may you develop a rhythm of life where you work and have a rich, full life, but at one in seven, you make space to rest, to be refreshed, to let God fill you again. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.